which is now broken off quite significantly over the last two years. Once that melts, there's considerably less ice to, re to reflect the heat back into, the, into space. So the sea acts as a sump and takes the heat in and it warms the water and it melts more ice, so it accelerates. So you're in this situation where, where these, these interconnected things are reaching a point, as I said earlier, of utter collapse. And then we have our own systems, which we continue to play with, such as the World Banking System, which, as we know, in 2008, against all of the trajectories that the, economic, the economists were telling us, <laughs> fell apart. And I've been to parts of the United States since then, um, places such as Detroit, where you cannot imagine that they will ever co go back to the type of lifestyles that they live there. In fact, the people in that city have pretty much given up on the idea that economic recovery through mass production is the route to take. What they're, going to, what they're doing and what we're working on them with in, 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 in our project in Todmorden as a series of underground projects around the planet looking at food is how do you feed your communities, how do you create new types of communities that become resilient in times of radical change. And this is right in the middle of the most affluent, rich, powerful country on the planet, the United States. And if you sit in Detroit City and you look around it looks like some sort of Mad Max movie. There's buildings that are just empty and windows broken everywhere and a community that is shattered. And what they're trying to do is understand, in a sense, the consequences of that economic collapse. But at the same time, they're realising that they are never going to get back to what they were because the motor industry in that city will never go back. So they haven't got the mass employment that they once had. So they have to reinvent themselves. So where we, where, we, where we are with this, if you like, is, is a series of really quite challenging issues, not just for us as communities, but for our businesses. This comes from Lloyds of London, not known to be a conservative, uh, not known to be the most progressive organisation. It's a very conservative organisation. But look at the seven points that they're making in their recent report from 2010 to, to businesses in the world, and particularly to global businesses. First of all, they're saying no one knows how quickly climate change will happen or how severe the consequences will be. Well, that's true. We don't know. But what we do know is that there are certain things already well underway that are going to have significant effects. Secondly, climate change need not prevent well-run organisations from succeeding. That is true. But it can never again be business as usual. This is from the company that underwrites all the major sort of shipping pro projects. A lot of the big global businesses use them. They're saying it will never again be business as usual. Water will become a scarce commodity, commercially and strategically. Climate change means food production will not increasingly fail to meet demand and global food markets could change substantially. So we're looking at how we build sustainable production techniques. Under climate change, energy markets are likely to become more volatile in supply or demand. Supply or demand can take place rapidly. So the idea of things suddenly changing if a market opens up. Niger is a typical example of what's happened in Africa regularly over the last decade. You end up with food riots in one place and civil, chaos, civil disorder because people can't feed themselves because other people want to take that food and put it somewhere else where they can get more money for it. Um, there's a risk of mass migration from the developing to the developed world. Well, that's very obvious. If you can't feed your people, you'll go and find a place to go and live. What does that say about the geopolitical system that we operate? How do we deal with our border controls? You know, we already have some of the most repressive border systems in, Euro in the world, in our European Union. I mean, it, you know, Britain is a great example. It's hard to get in. Yeah? Um, but, but, but think about that in terms of just Europe. Climate change suggests that southern Italy is possibly, within the next 50 years, going to be almost uninhabitable because we won't be able to grow plants there because temperature is averaging in, in, over that period at about 34 to 36 degrees Celsius. Now, that's too hot for plants to photosynthesize. So what you end up with is people having to go and live somewhere else in order to feed themselves. So, you know, even within the European Union, we will have pressures on the north, the northern, northern countries. Um, and that's to go, you know, the business will have a vital role in the 
migration and adaptation to climate change. Yeah, Lloyds, you're right, it will, because people work in businesses and they have to make a living. However, we also have to think about that on the bigger scale. And that's where I, I take this stuff as an interesting positional thing, but it's not just the world I live in. My community, my friends, my families, my education systems, my hospital systems are all facing the same thing. It's a universal challenge. And I think what we have to begin to then realise is that it isn't business as usual. And if there's one little bit more of this that I can push at you before we all go, oh God, and run out the door, it's this one. And this is just quite an extraordinary shift in the entire human experiment. For the first time in human history, the urban population has outnumbered the rural. More people now live in cities than live in the land, live on the land. Our relationship with the natural world is so profoundly fractured that we think it's better for us to live in our own built environments than to live in the world that is of us. And we get further and further dis distracted by that over time. We start to believe that the only thing that matters is our built environment and ourselves. And that, to me, is the key thing. All of the stuff I've told you are symptoms. They're symptoms of a much bigger problem. And that is that we are, in a sense, we've, we've, we've stuck ourselves in the ego. We think that we can solve everything. And what we have to do is reinvent the relationship with the eco. We have to come back to the idea of ecology and ecosystem and us being part of it rather than apart from the natural environment. And that's the sum of what I think this tells us, that the, all that story, all that stuff are symptoms of that big, big fracture between ourselves and the natural environment. And we have to relearn what the natural environment means to us and how it nurtures us and how it gives us the opportunity to actually live on this planet, not just for the next generation, but forever. And that's the key point of the first part of this talk, really. That all those things are component pieces of just that simple fracture from ego to eco. So, we can put the lights up for a minute because I'm going to give you a minute or two just to think about that and talk to each other and then I'm going to try and work out my next set of slides, okay? I'd like you just for a second to talk to your partners on the table, your elbow partners. Just ruminate on that. Just, just tell each other your story. Are you tired of living like a savage? Tired of wondering where your next meal will come from? Bored with nothing but agriculture and pastoral living? Then why not try civilization? Here's how it works. Our civilization engineers will arrive and take stock of the situation. They will assess your land value and decide what useful resources your land has to offer. Then, our efficiency experts will determine how best to liberate those resources for productive use. But don't worry, our team won't forget your most valuable resource. That's right, your labor power. Our consultants will quickly organize your people to make the best use of their time and productive energy. Before long, your people will have jobs and be well on their way to a civilized lifestyle. Following a brief period of transition, during which our specialists will help educate the public and counter objections, you'll have all the benefits of civilized society, including wages paid hourly for your hard labor. With these wages, you'll be able to buy food, clothing, and shelter. In fact, everything you used to provide for yourself will now be provided by someone else. Plus, instead of having to do a variety of things, you will only have to do one thing. Your life will be simplified. In your new civilized society, you won't wonder where your next meal is coming from. You'll know it's coming from your next paycheck. As long as you do what our experts tell you to do, we'll make sure you have enough to make ends meet. But wait. There's more. 
As an added bonus, we'll make sure your kids get an education to prepare them for the civilized life. Within a few short generations, your people won't remember that there was ever another way to live. Even better, your contributions will make it possible for our civilization planners to spread civilization throughout the world. Not convinced yet? Then here's the best reason to choose civilization. There is simply no alternative. Civilization, it's your future today.